This is a sample chapter from Fitton Books. Chapter 3 Six months after Greg's murder, the sadness persisted. Trips back to her parents' house in Michigan and a weekend at her brother's house did nothing to ease her pain. Like a spreading virus inside her body, she thought of Greg constantly. In January, she returned to teaching math at the middle school, but December's events consumed her thoughts. Her devotion to her students would not erase the terrible tragedy infecting her life. As summer vacation approached, Ben arranged a 10-day Caribbean cruise commencing on June 15th. She bounced between website destinations in Jamaica and Mexico where the Hannibal Cruise Lines had ports of call. Two hours passed one day when she did not think of Greg at all, but she became overwhelmed with guilt when she replayed his bloody death in her mind. She stared teary-eyed out the window at the huge suburban homes that were filled with families and married couples along Eastview Drive. 3.19 p.m., July 15, 1993. An unusually heavy humidity hung in the late spring air as dark clouds accompanied a cold front, causing severe thunderstorms and heavy downpours. Caroline left late for the airport. She packed some newly purchased clothes and Greg's high school yearbook into her lavender suitcase. In less than an hour, she had to meet Ben aboard the plane. She took the shortest way to the airport, averting any rush hour traffic on the connector road through the woods. She would easily catch the plane if she hurried. The wipers pushed back the rain. She reached into her carry-on, as she had on quiet afternoons at the cemetery, and slid out Greg's crimson vinyl yearbook. The inside covers contained a black-and-white overlay of Paul Revere High School in Reedsville, Pennsylvania. In handwritten ink, the simple verses of Greg's high school friends were scrawled across the inner cover photograph of the school's large stone columns and front steps. The wide quadrangle slabs in their symmetrical alignment to the Roman numeral clock tower high above mesmerized her. Beautiful old trees spread over the walkway. The adjacent parking lot, full of oversized cars, harkened back to another era. She turned the glossy pages quickly until she found Greg's black and white formal high school picture. Greg, thinner, his hair dark and cropped, wore a narrow, solid tie and white shirt. Without his glasses, he appeared strong and vibrant. An optimistic glow overflowed the portrait. Below the picture was an impressive array of credits achieved over his four years at Revere. He had no nickname, just Greg. She had written to Reedsville. The responses, both from the newspaper and the police, confirmed what she had suspected. Greg had been truthful about his relationship with Marco St. Germain. Marco had maliciously killed the young hitchhiker who had advanced knowledge of his drug dealings. Brought to trial and convicted for premeditated murder, mostly because of Greg's testimony, Marco faced life imprisonment in Pennsylvania. She thumbed to the picture of Mark J. St. Germain. No credits were posted under his photograph, but he had acquired the nickname Marco. He maintained a blatant and defiant dark-eyed stare. Then she turned directly to the candid shot of Marco, clad in his black leather jacket and collar turned up, with one leg perched on the wide stone steps and a cigarette butt wedged in the corner of his mouth, his brand of evil bypassed time. She slammed the book shut, stuffed it back in the carry-on, and concentrated on the winding road. At first, the rain only smeared the windshield, but soon the showers pelted the car and the road. She sped across the countryside as lightning, followed by cracking thunder, flashed intermittently. Leaves whipped by her window, some sticking to the windshield, before being swept away by the wipers. Caroline squinted at the surging water smearing the windshield as she navigated through the uninhabited area. The fuzzy outline of the East Greenwich Bridge meant she had driven within a few miles from the interstate. In the side mirror, the red taillights blended into the darkness. She gripped the wheel, 
as a bright chain lightning display flashed across the sky and the subsequent thunder cannonade shook the car. She flicked the high beams again. A hunched over old woman with ghostly white hair and draped in a knitted shawl shuffled along the bridge walkway between the girders. When the woman turned, Caroline recognized her from the restaurant last December. Instinctively, she accelerated but skidded onto the bridge's metal grid surface. She kept the pedal down and sped onto the opposite riverbank. In the mirror, the bridge faded to blackness as she raced down the narrow road. With the interstate just ahead, Caroline breathed deeply, dismissing the sighting as a part of her grief, and she neared a long row of trees close to the highway. Soon, she would be on her way to the airport. But as she moved under the trees, the East Greenwich Bridge reappeared again, and this time the white-haired woman stood center on the grid and within the storm's turmoil. Caroline crunched her foot against the brake pedal. The car careened past the old lady toward the hill. The engine whined as she consistently checked the rearview mirror. She accelerated and kept repeating her disbelief as she started up the hill again. The woman and the East Greenwich Bridge materialized in the mist at the bottom of the hill. Not knowing how to break the cycle, she methodically stopped the car and peered over her right shoulder as she backed up the hill. Then she continued her journey to the airport. A bright glare near the tree cluster ahead prompted her to wonder if lightning had struck the ground. She shielded her eyes at the intensity, but as she approached the bare tree cluster, silhouetted in the stark light, the outline of the East Greenwich Bridge formed in the road ahead, and so did the old woman. This is insane! Gritting her teeth, she pushed the gas pedal and for a second thought about running down the gypsy. At incredible speed, Caroline whizzed by the woman, bounced over the bridge and careened up the other side. The ghostly woman and the misty bridge vanished in the storm. She nodded when the green interstate signs, white letters reflected in the headlights. The delay might cause her to miss the plane, but at least the nightmare had ended. Cars zoomed down the highway as she signaled and veered up the ramp. She peered over her shoulder, but as she turned, it prepared to merge onto the interstate. The East Greenwich Bridge materialized. Her car rolled forward. Through the swishing wipers, the sight of the gypsy's coal eyes frazzled Caroline's already frayed nerves. She raised her hands to her mouth, and then she pulled at the door handle. In the mirror, the old lady floated as if she were buoyant on the ocean. Caroline slammed her foot against the pedal, revving the engine, but she remained on the bridge. The rain tapped a persistent drumbeat against the car roof, and the wipers accompanied the cadence. She bashed the steering wheel. The woman's ghostly form appeared at the side door. In unison, the electronic locks popped up. Caroline clawed at the door handle, but it loosened and then fell into her hand. A chilling air and the outside crack of thunder followed the gypsy into the car. No, no! I am aware of your problem. She had the same heavy accent. Her clothing and hair were dry. Why are you in my car? Do you prefer that I leave your life the way it is? I don't understand. How is this possible? This can't be happening. I don't believe you're real. I assure you, Caroline, that you only see a snippet of reality. Caroline jabbed her finger. You knew that Greg was going to die last December, and I don't know why you are out here in the middle of nowhere and why I keep coming back to this bridge. You have returned to where you need to be. Don't talk in riddles. I want to know why this is happening. It is not necessary that you know. I have asked you a question. Would you prefer to leave your life the way it is? Are you talking about Greg being dead? I am aware of the flow of change all around us. Then she paused and folded her hands as she looked upward. What, what is all around us? Other realities twisting and turning as if in nature. Vast whirlpools of existence, 
like a mighty river flowing from the source. Only you can choose, Caroline. Only you can choose to become part of these primordial forces. I still don't understand. It is you who can become the catalyst, the agent of change, neatly stitching the fabric of time. You, Caroline, can annihilate the present. You can maneuver these forces and prevent your husband's untimely death. No, that is impossible. Greg is dead. How did you know Greg was going to die? I am a part of these forces, the unseen forces that are all around you. You knew Marco St. Germain, didn't you? You cannot understand. I am one with forces beyond your comprehension. I gather the energies for you, Caroline. But you must be the catalyst. I will return to nothingness, but you will participate. You cannot begin to understand. I am one with the forces beyond your comprehension. I can gather the energies for you, Caroline, but you must be the catalyst. I will return to nothingness, but you will participate. But you knew Greg was going to die, and I miss my husband. Do you understand? If you had listened, your husband would be alive now. No more delay. Board the plane with your uncle, but understand the implications of your actions from this moment onward by boarding that plane. Caroline, overwhelmed and confused, shielded her eyes to the same blinding light she had seen only a few minutes before in the tree cluster. Breathing carefully, she attempted to compose herself, but when she opened her eyes, the woman had vanished. She twisted toward the rear window. Where are you? She gripped the wheel, but as she crossed the bridge, she sensed, like that night in the restaurant, that she had entered another realm. All the way up the hill, as she glanced in the mirror, she sensed forces beyond her control.